Thank you so much for coming. I love my uh, cheering section here in, in front. It, this is awesome. I gotta get, a, gotta get a selfie with you guys after we're done. So, so I wanted to start the talk a little bit about um, how I got interested in this type of research. So when I was in medical school, we had these uh, problem-based learning groups. I think we still have them now, I'm not sure. It was a while ago. Um, but we were presented these cases that seemed like a mystery. It was like solving a mystery. And I got the impression that being a doctor was like being a detective. Like, like you figure out what the patient has. And each week, we'd be presented with a new symptom. There'd be like a rash or like a shooting pain and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and it seemed like figuring out the right treatment was also kind of part of this mystery. So now, uh, we'll say a few years later, um, I kind of have a different perspective, at least in the work that I do as an addiction psychiatrist. Um, it seems like most of the time, we know what the patient has. Um, a lot of the times, it's a chronic condition, a common chronic condition, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis. Um, and a lot of the times, we know what to do about it. Um, in fact, we probably talk to our patients a lot about what to do about it. Take your medicine, don't smoke, eat better, exercise, right? If we could all do this, though, on our own, like, I think doctors would be out of business, right? So, so these are all like lifestyle behaviors. So, so indeed, when you look at the data, um, the most common causes of death in the United States are caused by these lifestyle behaviors. Um, I've still not seen a pheochromocytoma in my whole uh, career, but this is like one of the really exciting, dramatic things we learned in medical school, but really like kind of, a, kind of a boring, but very common, important thing that seems to be such a challenge for patients, and that's changing their lifestyle. Um, and I thought this graph was really interesting because some of the things that um, you'd think would be really, really popular, and they're, they're very important to be sure, um, illicit drug use, overdoses, firearms, things like that, they don't even come close to comparing to the number of deaths caused by diet and inactivity and smoking. So it seems like in the last 20 years, we've made little progress in helping patients change these critical lifestyle behaviors. We've made some progress with smoking and alcohol use, but um, diet and inactivity seems to be getting potentially worse. And um, I noticed this medical errors. It seems like it's gotten worse recently since we had EMRs, but that's a whole different talk. So, so how do people change? So actually, there's a lot of research on how people change health behaviors. Um, so based on patterns of change observed in adults, mostly men, who drank too much, Prochaska and DiClemente um, came up with their now very famous trans-theoretical stages of change model. So this is a model that describes this process of change that has many different stages. So you know, people don't just kind of change when their doctors tell them to, right? So, First they're, first, they're not ready. They don't really think their behaviors are causing them any problems. Then, then apparently, they start to get ready. They think about pros and cons. They start to think behaviors are a problem. Then they prepare. They start to maybe talk about it, take small steps. Then they change. And what we hope people do is to maintain these changes and then enter the termination phase, which means that they have, look at this, zero temptation to go back. <laughs> yeah, that would be great, huh? So anyways. Um, but this is a really, you know, this is a really great model to describe a lot of different health behaviors. But it seems to me that something very dif different seems to be happening when you examine what happens to women who smoke cigarettes who then get pregnant. So right now, still about one in seven women in the United States are cigarette smokers. Uh, it's about one in four among poor women. And if you, if you look at non-pregnant women in any given year, the chance that they will successfully quit smoking is only 6% in one given year. So it's higher among um, more educated women. And even with treatment, so even with nicotine, nicotine replacement th therapy, gum, patch, lozenges, there's so many now, um, or, or medication, the success rate only increases to 20 to 30%. So um, really hard habit to change. But let's look at pregnancy. A whopping 45% of women who smoke cigarettes just stop. They suspend smoking during gestation without any treatment. And by one, and this is many months now, right? So we're talking nicotine withdrawal, irritability, you know, hunger, difficulty concentrating. Don't smoke during pregnancy, but then after delivery, most of them relapse. The baby's out and they, they start smoking again, by and large, and then about a quarter remain ex-smokers. 
Okay, so here's another way to look at these stark differences in smoking cessation patterns. So if you have non-pregnant smokers, so this is men and women, if you look at their cigarettes per day over time, smoking, they become convinced to quit for whatever reason, um, they make their first quit attempt, but then they usually make many quit attempts before they're able to become ex stable ex-smokers. And why is that? Nicotine's really addictive. So um, withdrawal symptoms actually start one hour after the last cigarette. Um, these include irritability, difficulty concentrating, hunger, um, a, a restlessness. So it's very um, highly addictive and very difficult to quit. So it's really in those early weeks. And these nicotine withdrawal symptoms, they usually last a few weeks um, and then taper off. So it's usually in those first few weeks that it's physically hardest to stop for non-pregnant women and men. But if you look at the pattern in spontaneous quitters, and I'm going to use this term to describe women who are smoking, become pregnant, and stop without treatment. So I'm going to use this term spontaneous quitters, and it was defined by Solomon in 2014. And this, this population has received a little bit of attention in terms of patterns. Um, but they so they, they find out they're pregnant, they pre they're find out they're pregnant, they stop smoking, don't smoke throughout gestation, and then start smoking again after delivery. So what is going on? So here's the stages of change model. Before pregnancy, they're not planning on quitting. Bam, right into the action phase. They skip all over, you know, they skip over all these other steps. They, and, you know, no preparation, no, and, and, and it was really interesting, the, um, the work by Buja and colleagues, um, they actually interviewed women on what kinds of coping strategies they use to stay abstinent during pregnancy, and they don't use the same ones that non-pregnant women use, like, oh, I, you know, I started chewing gum, I used a distraction, I started to you know, exercise more, whatever, whatever, these other coping skills. Um, pregnant women don't report using those. They just say, you know, well, I was pregnant, so I stopped. <laughs> um, and they maintain, again, they maintain the change throughout pregnancy, and then after delivery, so it's like this action, maintain, relapse kind of pattern as opposed to the, the stages of change model. So, so why is this important? So maternal smoking during pregnancy actually is still the leading modifiable cause of low birth weight and preterm birth in the United States and in many nations worldwide. It affects one in nine births in the United States, and it's associated with certainly short and long-term risks um, to moms, the pregnancy, and the children. What are some of these risks? So children prenatally exposed to smoking are increased risk for preterm birth and low birth weight. I talked about those, but also SIDS, ADHD, other disruptive behaviors, conduct disorder, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, later, and substance use disorders and antisocial personality disorder. And this is hardly an exhaustive list. Um, maternal smoking during pregnancy has been linked to a lot of different common medical conditions, um, including heart disease and things like that for, for children throughout the lifespan. Um, not, so we don't know that this is causal, of course. This is, these are associations. But there are high risks associated with this exposure. So it's, really, it's, a, it's a really pretty common public health problem. So, what are the, so one way to study mechanisms of change is to identify barriers of change. And then you can try to lower these barriers. So for example, spontaneous quitters, compared to persistent smokers, are more likely to be married, more highly educated, and they were probably smoking less at baseline, so they might be less addicted. So the first two of these are not really modifiable quickly. Regarding addiction to nicotine, what's interesting is that nicotine replacement therapy for smoking cessation it still exposes the fetus to risk, and we do know that there's a direct effect of nicotine on low birth weight, um, mediated by vasoconstriction and other mechanisms. So there's still some harm, um, but surprisingly, it's not even that effective. Um, some clinical trials actually stop because women um, are smoking on top of the patch, and so continuing to expose women to nicotine delivered by the patch is not ethical, so they you know, remove the patch and, and, and remove the woman from the study. Um, so now there are barriers to change that are, that are important to address, and those are depression during pregnancy um, and also partner smoking, so those are modifiable. But um, nonetheless, another way to examine mechanisms of change is to look at what's going right. What are the characteristics in successful spontaneous quitters that enable them to quit smoking suddenly and successfully during pregnancy? Um, 
And I started to get really interested in this um, and started to look at, first, how women who quit differ from women who do not quit beyond differences in demographics and nicotine dependence. So I did a literature review, of course. Um, so there are over a 1,000 citations on this topic. Um, and I was looking for studies that were observational in nature um, that controlled for these confounders that we talked about that are associated with smoking. And at the time of this review, so this was 2012, um, there were only actually eight studies in non-intervention samples that actually used regression models to control for confounders um, like demographics. Um, the bulk of this work was done by Lori Wachschlag, one of my mentors now, um, and um, only four were longitudinal, meaning they collected data over time, okay, and then only two included biochemical verification of cessation. So, so smoking is stigmatized. Smoking during pregnancy is even more stigmatized. So when you um, ask for report, you also want to be able to um, have a biomarker to verify the report. So it's kind of like a check, kind of like a check because there's a lot of reporting bias. So what did they find? So, so, so one, one thing that was really interesting is that when, nicot when you control for nicotine dependence or how addicted a woman is to smoking in the first place, mom's history of, of mental illness actually is not related to her tendency to quit smoking during pregnancy. So as the eternal optimist I am, thinking this is great news, this, is, this, this means that women with mental illness are just as likely to make this health behavior change and stop smoking during pregnancy, except with one exception, and th those are women with conduct disorder. So, so conduct disorder is a diagnosis that we make in adolescence that's characterized by behavior that violates social norms and the rights of others, and people with conduct disorder often exhibit low concern for others. So this is when I started to think about like empathy and concern for others as being maybe something, in, something important um, that's linked to smoking cessation um, during pregnancy. Um, and, and I began to think that there was something about the way these women relate to others, because the, some of these characteristics that, were so, that, that differentiated women who quit and women who didn't got me thinking about um, the way that women relate to others may be related to how they, the decisions or um, I think it's more complicated than that, but their, their smoking behavior during pregnancy, and that smoking cessation could also be viewed as, as one of the earliest parenting behaviors or parenting sacrifices, but it seems to be clearly done on behalf of the baby, um, um, and, 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 not, and, and not, it, doesn't really, be, it just doesn't really seem to fit a, a usual health behavior. And some of the qualitative literature, there's not a lot, but what there is is really, really provides some rich um, data to, 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 to vividly illustrate this. So Constantine is, um, um, did a qualitative study where um, she included direct quotes from women who quit smoking when they found out they were pregnant, and they are really fascinating. So, so pregnancy hit me really hard. I'm going to be a mom now. I can't be dumb anymore. She said that pregnancy was the best thing that happened to her. Look at this one. I'd gone to the library and gotten a bunch of books, and one of them had like a two-page chapter on smoking when you're pregnant. It was terrible. After I read that, I did not have another cigarette, not one single puff the rest of the time I was pregnant. That is so powerful, right? How do we, how do we get that into like a pill, right? <laughs> and the day I thought I might have been pregnant, I quit smoking. I just quit until I knew for sure if I was or I wasn't. So if I wasn't, I would have continued smoking. And then she says, it was easy for me. Like before when I tried to quit, it felt so hard. But I think it was, some, it was knowing I had a baby inside of me. So I'm going to focus on empathy, but this is um, hardly the, the only construct that's probably involved. It's, it's one that we know a lot about from social neuroscience. I am definitely not a social neuroscientist, so I'm going to just disclose that right now. I'm going to show a picture of a brain, but, <laughs> but, um, but we do, we, there is a lot of research on empathy, and there are a lot of validated measures for empathy. So, um, there, so there are a lot of um, different definitions in the literature. Um, I am defining it as, I think, a common definition, the natural ability to perceive and be sensitive to the emotional states of others, and this is coupled with a motivation to care for their well-being. So, being able to perceive others' distress, but also caring about it. Um, the, the mechanisms in empathy seem to be highly conserved across species, meaning we see these in many, many different animals and their parenting behavior. And mammalian research suggests that empathy is rewarding 
reinforcing. So as an addiction psychiatrist, my ears are perking up. Rewarding, reinforcing. Um, and, and, and competes, at least in rats, competes with addictive rewards. So, so in experiments, rats will actually choose the smell, they'll choose a cage that has the smell of their pups over the cage that smells like cocaine after they've been trained to administer cocaine. That's kind of powerful, I think. Um, so empathy is thought to involve a pretty complex network of neural regions, which I'll show here. Um, that inv a lot involves perception, memory, um, and also judgment, um, as, as we see in the prefrontal area. Um, and the experience of empathy also involves the neuroendocrine systems and also the autonomic nervous system. Um, heart rate, how much you sweat, things like that. Um, so I haven't, just an aside about oxytocin, um, I did do another study about oxytocin. I haven't found a way to incorporate oxytocin into this study yet, but, um, but perhaps this is a sign. That Dr. Dr. Woodruff mentioned this, so this is a sign that it's time to bring it in, but I actually won't be talking about oxytocin today, but I do think it's somehow related. Okay, anyways. Okay, so, so I created a very simplified schematic, really a Venn diagram, to, to start to, to think about empathy, different facets of empathy, and how they might actually be related to smoking behavior during pregnancy. So, so most theorists will agree there are two, kind, two components of empathy. Affective empathy, which refers to sensing the distress of others, simply sensing it, not necessarily knowing their, not necessarily being able to take the perspective of other people. Um, and there's cognitive empathy, which describes the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Okay, so to kind of, to really kind of be able to imagine what someone else is going through. Okay, and then um, to truly behave empathically as opposed to just have sympathy or just to kind of feel sorry for someone, um, it's, it's important to be able to manage one's own emotions. So if you see someone in pain and it just makes you completely break down and you just go to pieces, um, the ability to imagine their perspective or to actually help them is diminished, right? So, so true empathic concern, as I'm de defining it, um, or empathic responding, also um, involves the ability to regulate one's own emotions and, and some kind of judgment. And so, so, if, so in the absence or in relative deficits of different components of empathy, for instance, um, individuals with autism spectrum disorders um, have challenges with cognitive empathy or imagining the perspective of others. So um, they can observe that someone's upset and not really know why. Um, if someone has difficulty with emotion regulation, they may understand the experience of someone else and feel it, but not know what to, not be able to do anything about it, feel overwhelmed. And, um, um, people with callous unemotional traits um, just really don't, remember I talked about the ability, the empathic concern or the ability to care, so you can actually know what to do about it and know what someone else is feeling but just not care. So, so, I, so I'm kind of thinking about empathic concern as kind of the conglomerate of these three, three facets operating at the same time. And, and um, this is sort of a, so I, am, I, did, I, I can't take credit for this model about empathy. The perception action model that was described by Desetti and Jackson um, um, is another way of describing this. Um, their model is, is using different parts of the brain. And I kind of like this Venn diagram for my purposes for this talk, so. Um, okay, so. So this, is, so this is something that I'd like to you know, talk about, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my trying to test this model. So, so instead of the stages of change model, I think that this, the, the model of different facets of empathy might better describe um, the different components that go into smoking cessation during pregnancy. So for affective empathy, I think it's important for women to probably have an emotional response to the pregnancy, but I also think this can be measured by um, their attachment style, how they relate to others in their life. Um, there's also ways of measuring attachment to the fetus, m emotional attachment to the fetus, I mean. I don't mean like the umbilical cord. Um, <laughs> and then um, perspective taking. Okay, so, so I also think it's, for, for cognitive empathy, I think it's important that Women also be able to internalize the experience of the fetus as like a separate entity with, with its own separate needs. One example of this is that one of the, okay, so one of the direct quotes from one of the qualitative studies, a woman, a woman said, well, when I, was, when I was pregnant, I went out drinking and dancing with my friends because my baby's gonna be like me, so she's gonna like to party. So, so like, 
So that's like a very well-intentioned young woman who, you know, um, who may have affective empathy, but is not totally internalizing like the fetus as having its separate needs as, and as being like a separate entity. And then the executive functioning, um, certainly with a habitual and addictive behavior like, like smoking, the ability to actually not smoke in the face of triggers and stress and things like, and, and nicotine withdrawal is certainly important. And so, and it also seems to me like other reasons that we know that women might stop smoking besides empathic concern for the baby, like due to social pressure, right? They don't wanna be judged. Um, it seems like they may also correspond to areas in this Venn diagram that correspond to like deficits in different, different parts of empathy. Um, and so um, some of the work, um, I was gonna talk a little bit more about some of the preparatory work that I did using um, a number of large prenatal cohorts generously donated by a number of mentors in the past, but I wanted to get kind of skip over to um, testing the model, but um, using using these these data sets um, really helped me to put together this model. Okay. So my main aim is to examine differences in empathy measured behaviorally, physiologically, and also by report um, between smokers who quit when they found out they were pregnant and women who did not. So testing this, um, my hypothesis that individual differences in empathy it, as a central mechanism to explain behavior, health behavior change like smoking during pregnancy. So I'm also gonna examine how empathy measured in early pregnancy might predict trajectories of smoking across gestation. And since empathy hasn't been formally measured during pregnancy, um, for all I know it might change. So. I will also explore how change in empathy across pregnancy relates to changes in smoking. So we're rec recruiting from local obstetric clinics um, using an electronic data warehouse search for women who have ever reported smoking and it was recorded in their electronic medical record. Um, and I should mention this entire study is approved by the IRB. Um, and uh, who currently have an obstetric appointment. And so potentially eligible women are approached for interest and eligibility and participation in, um, in a private setting within the obstetric clinics, um, usually in the room after the doctor has finished with the visit. So we're including all adult women who are English literate, who mostly because all of our tasks are in English, um, and who report smoking at the time that they recognize the pregnancy. Um, we're also including women who say they stopped smoking when they started to try to conceive. But basically, I wanna capture women who quit because of pregnancy to test my hypothesis. So we're excluding um, women who are in treatment or using nicotine replacement, um, mostly because I think that's going to kind of um, uh, attenuate the effects of empathy, but um, it might not. Um, we're also, um, excluding women with uh, disorders that are character characterized by known deficits in empathy. And I decided to, um, to also not include women who are heavy drinkers or, or, illicit drug or using illicit drugs, not because I'm not totally interested in this population as well, but because um, from my clinical experience and, and from some qualitative research, uh, actually some of my quantitative, quantitative stuff has shown this too. So, um, women who are poly substance users often will stop using the illicit substances and keep smoking or keep drinking. Or some women who quit smoking actually start drinking more. Um, so we, we, it's, it's actually kind of fascinating to me, like, because these are all kind of, I'll call them adaptations that, that women probably make well, in a well meaning fashion, but that um, for the purposes of this pilot study, this low budget career development award study, <laughs> I'm just going to focus on um, the smoke, just the, just the um, smoking alone, cigarette smoking alone. I, I, do, I do definitely hope to also understand whether this model applies to other substances, though, during pregnancy. And we do have a certificate of confidentiality um, from the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, for this study. So this protects the confidentiality of um, participants. In cases where there's like a subpoena from a judge or something like that, Northwestern University and the study team, myself, the PI, we can, we can legally refuse to disclose any information that we collect since we are collecting sensitive information. And we do share that with participants that we have this certificate. Okay, so, 
So I'll talk about a little bit more about the measures. So, oh, I will talk about the, the procedures first. So at baseline, um, we collect information about their smoking. We have two biomarkers for smoking, which I'll talk a little bit more about in detail, and three performance-based um, tasks of empathy and a bunch of questionnaires. So I also am gonna assess mood, anxiety, stress, things that are known to be associated with smoking in general, but also um, related constructs like attachment and personality. Uh, basically, I, I, yeah, this is a construct that I think it might be difficult. I think, sometimes I think I pick the, the most difficult thing ever to measure or to study, but I think it's interesting, so I'm gonna study it. Um, we're gonna follow them monthly with um, online questionnaires to assess change um, and to have some real-time data about their smoking. And then the third trimester, we follow up and um, get the biomarkers again, get the smoking again. So let's talk about assessing empathy. So there's actually to date only one performance-based task, meaning um, measuring something by having someone do something to measure their ability as opposed to telling the asking them to tell you about their ability, to really see them do it. So that's what I mean by performance-based. So there's one validated performance-based task that measures affective empathy, which includes empathic concern, which is sort of at the heart of my hypothesis. And that's actually a pain paradigm. So it turns, so it turns out that um, sensing others' empathy for pain is thought to engage the same neural networks um, or the neural networks um, involved in also caring for others' well-being. So um, the task goes like this. So participants are, are, are shown these digital images. First, they're given a neutral face. To so this actually increases salience to the brain. So when you see a face, actually your brain kind of gets more interested in looking at what's going to come after that. So there's a face. And there are neutral conditions to as a control. And then there are pain conditions. So, And there's all sorts of... I heard someone gasp. There's a high empathy person here in the crowd. <laughs> yeah. So, so they're shown, and so, so they're shown 40 different images um, with the neutral ones to control for um, any kind of variability and just responding. Some people just rate high. Some people just rate low. And they're asked to rate how much pain is, the, is this person in. So this taps into affective sharing, or like how much, how much pain do you perceive when you when you see a stimulus that's about pain. And, and these, these um, paradigms um, are, are ones developed by um, a collaborator, um, Jean Dossetti at University of Chicago, who's like kind of the, now he like his whole career, he's like studies empathy. So this, I was really, really delighted to have him help with this. Um, okay, so empathic concern, similar, so we use the similar stimuli. This is a, another example of a stimuli. So you have your neutral face, you have the neutral, and then you have the neutral condition and the pain condition. And there's all these different pictures of like hands and feet and, and, and these are really, really salient to the brain and triggering that activation in that pain network, okay? So you're looking at it so like, this has nothing to do with smoking during pregnancy. But from, from, based on my hypothesis, I think this is tapping into the same neural network as empathic concern. So this is why I'm using these. They're all, they're all, this is also the, the only one that's really existed, as I mentioned, as, um, as a behavioral measure. Um, so, how, that, so they're asked, how sorry do you feel for this person? And that is... Um, taken as a measure of empathic concern. To measure cognitive empathy, so again, the ability to take someone else's perspective, okay, cognitive empathy, the, the green circle. So um, this is what a really, really commonly used test. It's called the reading in the mind of the eyes test. So you see these eyes, you have to guess what emotion is being depicted. Um, I kind of, I think some of these are actually not that easy. Like, you know, this second one, right, is this person, maybe regretful, but anyways. Maybe my empathy is not that good. No, no. <laughs> um, I'm also using um, um, uh, a, bad, a, a test called the Revised Pen Emotional Recognition Test. So there's, you see a whole face. Again, you select the emotion. And I should mention that Morris Goldman, a researcher in my department um, who studies empathy and schizophrenia, he was so generous in donating this. Er, he, he's allowing me to use his empathy battery. So. Um, this really gets, there's also a morphed faces um, uh, test. So they identify, identify the emotion. Okay. And then remember when I s talked about how empathic responding also involves the autonomic nervous system. So when, when people have it, empathic responses, apparently it, um, there's a sympathetic response. That, that means that their heart rate 
um, changes, actually heart rate variability changes, people start sweating more. And so you can actually detect that. And so there are widely used physiologic measures of general affective responding. Um, so these aren't necessarily specific to empathy, but they tap into how, how, like how, how physiologically, how physically moved are you when you see someone in pain. And so, for example, you, you see a face, and so we use skin conductance. So um, the rate at which uh, an electric signal is conducted across your skin actually changes if you start sweating more. So that's what we're detecting. And we also detect heart rate variability. So we, we have a two-lead EKG um, while on the women while they're doing these tasks. So more heart rate variability is associated with um, a greater degree of empathic responding. And so since a lot of the qualitative liter literature was so rich, um, uh, I decided to use also a qualitative measure. And I decided to use a five-minute speech sample. It's just as quick as it sounds. It takes five minutes. That's one of the reasons. <laughs> it's very feasible. But um, it, it measures expressed emotion. So, so expressed emotion refers to the, um, it's a measure of the family environment. And it's based on how relatives of a psychiatric patient spontaneously talk about the patient. Um, high expressed emotion is kind of the opposite as it sounds. So high expressed emotion is bad. It, it's high, it means it's high in hostility, criticism, and over emotional involvement. And um, in a lot of psychiatric literature, high expressed emotion in family members is associated with poorer prognosis for patients with mental illness. And it actually predicts relapses in certain illnesses like schizophrenia. Maternal expressed emotion is actually, so hostility, criticism, emotional over-involvement, is actually re inversely related to the long-term health of emotion, uh, emotional health of children. So a Dutch group that, um, uh, that Rebecca Newmark and I actually were on a conference call with, uh, this one other group, uh, University of Amsterdam, they actually developed a pregnancy-specific five-minute speech sample. And it's, it's been used in the Generation R study, which is a, it's a large, large study, a lo longitudinal cohort of um, women and children, um, to assess expectant mothers' hopes expect and expectations for the unborn child. And so what we do is we actually ask women to tell, tell us about their unborn child. We want to know what their expectations and hopes will, but also how they would like to relate to their child. And so after they begin to speak, we record it. And then we're um, sending their, the transcripts to um, UCLA Family Program, and they're going to be um, coded for these facets, um, hostility, criticism. And so the hypothesis is that um, higher hostility and criticism will be related to a tendency to smoke persistently during pregnancy. Oops. So I'm also assessing um, personality measures that are related to empathy, also moral sensitivity, the just sensitivity scale, and relational interdependence, and also a lot of constructs related to cigarette smoking, anxiety, mood, uh, motivation, body image concern, impulsivity, perceived stress, other drug use, and conduct disorder. To assess smoking, we're using um, the timeline follow-back method. Um, so this is a validated method to assess um, smoking quantity and, and really the use of a lot of different substances retrospectively. So here's an example calendar. Um, and so give them the calendar. We asked um, participants to put events of personal salience, salience, salience to them, like, OK, this is when I moved. This is when, um, this is when my birthday was. And then they are asked to fill in the cigarettes per day in any order that they wish as it sort of pops up in their mind. Um, and, this, and, and this method actually mimics the way memories are naturally structured. And so, so women are. Um, actually able to fairly accurately recall um, cigarettes per day on each day. So as mentioned before, I'm also going to get two biomarkers of smoking. Um, we're using co cotinine in urine and expired carbon monoxide. So they both have pros and cons. This is an example of the expired carbon monoxide. You blow into it, it looks kind of like a breathalyzer, but it's actually picking up carbon monoxide as the alcohol. Um, it's very quick. Um, and as you might imagine, these are only as useful as long as the half-lives of these, um, these metabolites. So um, th these markers, combined with timeline fallback, is really kind of the gold standard to, to assess detailed patterns of smoking during pregnancy. OK, finally, right? So I only have a tiny bit of data to show you, um, but um, I, hope, I hope you find it as interesting as I do. So let's start with. 
um, the timeline follow back pattern. So this is a line graph of daily smoking. You have cigarettes per day on the, um, the Y axis and days from week before the uh, pregnancy recognition on the X axis. And so these are the first three participants. Um, day eight is the day that they found out they were pregnant. So we'll start with the first participant here in blue. So here's their baseline visit, and we caught them at different points in pregnancy, which is why some of them look longer than others, but this is the first participant. So she was smoking three cigarettes a day, um, and then um, to one, and then she found out, she found out she was pregnant, and, and, and uh, reported smoking zero cigarettes until the time of the baseline visit, and her expired carbon monoxide was consistent with that. Here's the second participant. So we got her later in pregnancy, so that was her baseline visit. So, so again, um, her knowledge, knowledge of pregnancy, still back here. So this is really interesting. One of the research assistants told me, research assistants who um, told me that when she found out she was pregnant, she decided, she says so she made a plan to start cutting down by one cigarette per day per week, which is which is kind of what she did. This is what she, this is what she reported she did. And then about two weeks before. The baseline visit, she got down to zero, but then had a number of lapses, and um, she told us she smoked the day before um, just um, one and a half cigarettes, and so her expired carbon monoxide is consistent with that. Um, and here's the third participant. So she was smoking six cigarettes a day. Um, the day she found out she was pregnant, again, day eight, she smoked four, so there's a little dip down, and then six after that. Um, and then there was one day that she didn't smoke. Um, that coinc coincided with Father's Day. Um, I didn't actually explore what that was about. Maybe I should have, but she didn't smoke any on Father's Day. And then after that, um, she smoked three cigarettes a day. Um, and, and her expired carbon monoxide um, reading was also consistent with um, continual smoking. So we, have two, so we have two persistent smokers and one spontaneous quitter so far. Yes, that is it. So um, just a little bit about the demographics, because we know that there are a lot of um, demographic characteristics associated with persistent smoking. So these two women are actually similar in age. Um, they're both married. They're both first-time pregnancies. Um, as we would expect, the persistent smoker has less education. Um, annual income is actually fairly similar, um, and both pretty high. <laughs> and um, the mean cigarettes per day um, prior to knowledge of the pregnancy is uh, as we would expect as well. So the persistent smoker was smoking more before she found out she was pregnant. Um, they both had, had, had partners that smoked. Um, the nicotine dependence um, measure the Fagerstrom. Um, I was kind of surprised. I don't know if it's maybe not so useful during pregnancy. They both scored a zero. Um, and um, expired, let's see. Oh, this was, the, this was also um, uh, unexpected. So, I, I always had hypothesized that women who didn't, couldn't stand the smell of smoke, uh, those smokers would just have a really easy time quitting, like they just wouldn't want it. But that doesn't seem to be the case with the persistent smoker, because she also reported an, an aversion, but she was still struggling to, you know, to stay quit. She, she was still smoking. So, um, so not sure about that. I probably should look into that um, at the biological level at some point in the future. Um, and then they were both fairly highly motivated to quit. So, so I've analyzed, um, actually, um, last minute in time for this talk, um, <laughs> some of the data from the um, affective empathy pain paradigm. So, so to, again, to assess affective sharing, so again, we have this um, stimulus, the neutral face, and the pain, um, uh, Stimulus, and so our, our spontaneous quitter is more affected by the perceived distress of others. So I'm kind of imagining, i.e., the the perceived distress of the fetus. And so, on the y-axis, we have the mean score from the 20 different images. How much pain is this person in? They're asked to rate on a scale of zero to 100. So our spontaneous quitter appears to have higher affective sharing than the persistent smoker. So she's perceiving. She perceived more pain than the persistent smoker did. So do spontaneous quitters have higher empathic concern? Do they care more? So again, we had the pain stimulus. And again, so on the y-axis, this is the mean score from the 20 different images. How sorry do you feel for this person? So again, the spontaneous quitter had a higher empathic concern. Well, apparently, I'll say, apparently higher empathic concern. There aren't. The N isn't large enough to do statistical testing, but it seems higher um, than the persistent smoker so far. Um, 
And the, the speech samples from the five minute speech sample for pregnancy, I and mean, they haven't been analyzed yet, but I did wanna show you some excerpts because um, not being a speech analyst, but being a clinician, they seem really different to me. So I'll see what you guys think. So as a reminder, we asked them, tell me about your unborn child. Um, what kind of relationship do you wanna have with your child? What are your hopes and expectations? And we record them. So these have been tr transcribed by a wonderful medical student, um, Jessica Lee. So here's the spontaneous quitters. Here's the woman who um, was smoking three cigarettes a day and then stopped smoking when she found out she was pregnant. Sometimes I imagine it's gonna be a miniature version of my husband. <laughs> I guess she's having a boy. We kind of laugh about that. I hope I can have a relationship like I have with my mom. I hope that they are not as much of a troublemaker as I was. So, so in the first two already, I get the sense, um, again, I'm not a speech analyst, but um, I get the sense that she's close to her husband. They laughed about this, they talked about it, and she likes her relationship with her mom. I hope that they bring my husband and I closer as opposed to the alternative. I hope that they're funny and cute. Obviously, I will probably think they are. <laughs> And so there's like sort of some, uh, some affection. I just want them to be as happy as I am. So we also know that she's happy. So, so um, I can't wait to see the results of the, the speech sample analysis. So here's the, what the persistent smoker said. I hope I can relate to her. Sometimes I feel that people you can't relate to in certain situations. So I hope I can always see her point of view. I hope that she gets along with other children, that she has good social skills, able to socialize. And then she said, some people are very private and they don't socialize. They can't interact with people. So I hope, I, can, I hope that she can interact. I hope she's not judgmental towards other people. She said, I don't want her to have any hatred in her body. I don't want her to feel any neglect. And I hope that she's healthy. I don't want her to go through anything traumatic in her life. So, so she's, she seemed to describe a lot of things that she hoped her baby wouldn't be. And um, again, just again, like it seems like there's a glimpse into some, how maybe some of her relationships might be in her life. So I can't wait to see what, uh, how it is coded. So that is all the data I have. I have so, <laughs> but I will give an update um, in December at our department psychiatry grand rounds. That's why this is called interim results. So I hope to have um, a dozen or hopefully more participants so we can see if some of these patterns um, are shown in a larger sample. Oh, this is also here on the third floor. So a lot of, a lot of the preparatory work um, that I did to prepare for the study was funded by um, grants to previous mentors. The Northwestern Memorial Foundation provided um, an evergreen grant that supported a lot of the time that um, I was here early on at Northwestern, and this current study is being funded by a five-year award by the, NI, by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And I've gotten so much support from my department, also the staff and um, practice managers and the providers from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Thank you so much for letting us interrupt your patient flow to help um, pregnant smokers. And the Department of Medical Social Sciences, they've just been amazing in helping me get a lot of these tasks together. So thank you, thank everyone there. I have an amazing study team, um, some of whom are gonna leave at the end of the summer. Some of these are research interns. Um, um, Rebecca Newmark, sitting right here in the front here. <laughs> Most of all, um, it's been really countless hours of support and guidance over many years from really, I've been just blessed with really, really great mentors, so. Thank you so much for your attention, and I will answer questions.